and I feel like the younger generations are starting to get it. However, I feel like they're getting too swayed by the allure of shit coins as opposed to understanding hard money and why their time and effort is being stolen away from them by inflation. All right, everyone, welcome back to Bitcoin is Hard. This is a Choice App production about Bitcoin and personal finance. Today, I am pumped up. I'm just saying it. The producer is not here. Twitter has been angry and wild all week. I'm hyped up on iced coffee, okay? Thursday morning, we're here with Marco of Whiteboard Finance, 845,000 subscribers on YouTube, teaches people about personal finance, okay? So I'm not even going to let him talk, not even letting him talk. I'm pulling up Twitter for explain this tweet right now. Marco says, you will not build wealth by skipping a $3 latte, making your own dishwasher tablets, clipping coupons, ordering water at a restaurant. You build wealth by taking massive action towards increasing your income and investing the difference in cash flow and assets, period. Marco, why did you tweet this? Why are you on YouTube? Why do you do what you do? Okay, so uh, for those that don't know me, uh, Marco Whiteboard Finance, regular dude, uh, suburb of Cleveland, regular guy, not some silver spoon, you know, trust fund kid. My parents are immigrants. Uh, I'm on YouTube because I want to help people with financial literacy. Okay, I feel like if I can do it, just being a regular person, anyone can. So uh, I got my finance degree, uh, Austrian ec- uh, economist, I guess, at heart, uh, Bitcoiner for sure. Um, I play both sides of the coin. I know the uh, fake fiat game. I also know the Bitcoin game. Okay. I try and profit from both. Uh, Bitcoin is my savings technology. But to get into that tweet, okay, so what I can't stand, my biggest pet peeve is these personal finance gurus, okay, who tell you, oh, skip the avocado toast. Millennials are broke because of avocado toast or the oh, make coffee at home and this and that. It's like, that's the biggest BS I've ever heard in my life. There are bigger forces at play, such as the macro steamroller, which you and I will most likely get into in this podcast. The macro steamroller is basically, hey, I'm saving all this money. Uh, I make 50 grand a year working a W-2 job, which is fine. But guess what? My kid's braces just went up 17%. My kid's tuition just went up 34%. Uh, you know, the cost of uh, milk, bread, and cheese went up you know, 17% while my wages went up, what? two, 3% maybe. So my point is, is that you can't out save your way um, or you can't save your way to wealth. You need to have your money work for you. And that comes through increasing your income and then also uh, by investing. Exactly. And that's the reason why I'm here to have said it on the podcast. The reason why we're doing this is to get Bitcoin podcast content and personal finance content crossing over because I've said it before, OG Bitcoiners were very good at talking about Bitcoin. They were very not good at talking about personal finance. And there's things that I would have done differently in my Bitcoin journey up to this point if I had been really dialed in on forcing both to cross over. Thankfully, I'm also a nerd like in both worlds, grew up on Dave Ramsey. And that's the reason why I appreciate what people like Marco are doing, because as I've said, we need to rewrite the personal finance advice. The world is completely different than it was, okay? So I'm done. I am personally done listening to people that talk about personal finance advice based on how the old world worked, okay? I'm here with you and Marco and you, the listeners, who I'm very thankful for because I love doing YouTube and I love doing this to rewrite this, okay? Because we have agency and that's what we're going to talk about today. So yes, the second tweet you had was very good. And it's saying the macro forces at play are too much to beat for people in lower to middle class incomes. Oh, you made coffee at home. Great college tuition. And I've said the same thing where I live in Southern California, the price of an average townhome is going up per week more than people make in a week. So that is a hamster wheel. Okay. So Marco, talk about this concept of making more money. Why, like, and delineate between how you say it versus you feel like some other, like, can, it can come across. Yeah, absolutely. So I feel like, you know, the guys that are sitting there trying to sell you a pipe dream or sell you a course, um, you know, they're the ones saying, oh, increase your income, do a side hustle. And don't get me wrong, the way some of those things are presented are sleazy, but the core message I do agree with, uh, because I think that we're at a point now where we're not like our parents, you know, baby boomers. I'm in my early mid thirties. I know you're probably similar, Brian. We both have kids, you know, wives, all that stuff. It, gone are the days of, Hey, I worked at Ford for 35 years. Uh, I put, you know, four kids through, you know, medical school and my wife didn't work and I have a pension, right? That doesn't exist anymore for the most part. Okay. So I think that the United States is still one of the greatest countries on earth where entrepreneurship is king, where you can still, um, 
you know, drastically change your life within a very short time through entrepreneurship or a side hustle. So I'm a big proponent of the big shovel theory. So Dave Ramsey does talk about this, get a bigger shovel. What does that mean? It means increase your income. So you can no longer save your way to wealth. You can no longer um, diet your way to a big muscular body. You're not going to eat salads and go for walks and pretend like you're going to get you know jacked, right? You have to lift heavy weights and do the work. So my point is, is that um, I'm going to use myself as an example. Um, I was working in corporate America, publicly traded bank, you know, W-2 job, made a great living for where I live uh, and the cost of living of where I live. But I was working on my YouTube channel on the side. So if you feel like you're on that never ending economic hamster wheel, which a lot of middle class Americans feel like um, lower middle class to middle class. Um, you need to increase your income so you can invest the difference into, as I mentioned in that tweet, cash flowing assets that will at least keep up with the pace of inflation, thus staving off the economic steamroller of the times we're living in right now. So my point is, is that, you know, if you have an internet connection, if you have a cell phone, you can start a blog, you can start a YouTube channel, you can start anything your mind uh, can think of, or you can figure out ways to start other businesses simply from the free information online. You don't have to buy some course to do this. Um, so some people may say, hey, Marco, you're special because you're good in front of a camera. Uh, you speak well, whatever. I, I understand that. But if you're not good in front of a camera, start a blog. If you're not good in, um, at a at writing, uh, start a podcast, ask good questions, be a good interviewer. There's so many different ways to monetize now. And I feel like uh, you need to be able to somehow increase that income while still working your day job, you know, and hoping uh, that the other one will overtake the other in terms of compensation. Totally. No. And so there's so much good stuff online about how to start side hustles and do that thing. The other thing that I like that you talk about is you can also work on increasing your W-2 salary. Like, and one thing I wanted to say and shout out is that I've been having this conversation with multiple people. Like we'll go on double dates, go on double dates and, set, and there's, here's a classic story. Hey, I work in X industry, but I still have to go into the office and I feel like I've hit a cap. I wish I had a work from home job. Boom. I think there's a lot of people that are in that bucket. Here's what you do if you're in that bucket. One thing that you can do, if you either, yes, you either go the side hustle route and create content online, which creating content online also helps build your personal brand. And that's where your resume, like your social mm -hmm. media is your resume now, like across the board, just who you are on the internet, who you are in the metaverse. I'm talking about metaverse. Me and Marco are in the metaverse right now. Our brands are talking and we're helping and doing things. So if that analogy doesn't fit for you. That's fine. Just can that analogy. But Look, here's what you do if you're stuck in that desk job still over there. You run with the advantages that you already have. You already have career years into that industry. Go find the tech companies that are transforming those industries and apply for jobs at those places. And then come into the interviews red hot with, I've been boots on the ground. I know all the friction that's over there. I love the mission and I want to help because you will blow away all the desk workers that have never stepped foot out their house onto the ground in the industry that you're in. Okay. And so you can be an extremely valuable asset and you have the ability to make more money by going to those companies. So Marco, we talked a little bit before, like I, I have this thing of like limiting beliefs. Like I like thinking about that and talking about that. I think of the reason why a lot of YouTube personal finance content can come across as pie in the sky or scammy or just yeah, like unattain hard to listen to. Yeah, is because like I'm on the other couch, like I'm on the other end of the couch. I feel the steamroller coming towards me, you know, that. So uh, what are your thoughts? Say some more thoughts on that. Yeah. So in terms of limiting beliefs and just to piggyback off of what you just said very quickly. So um, I'm a big proponent. I talk about this in my videos all the time. So say entrepreneurship isn't for you, right? The easiest way to make uh, pay jumps in this country is starting with a strong base. So my parents are immigrants. They came to this country with zero dollars, zero English. Uh, again, I'm not some silver spoon kid, you know, whatever. My point is, is that the fastest way to get out of lower middle class and actually start advancing your family tree is through education. So I think a lot of college degrees are BS and the ROI is not there. Um, however, focus on the ones that do have that ROI, the STEM, science, technology, engineering, math mathematics. Um, and then once you get into those positions, you can either do one of two things. You can crush it for two, three years, go find a recruiter, go get promoted either from within or go find another job where you get a pay jump of 20, 30%. Do that for 10, 15 years, and I promise you, you will be crushing it. You will be above average in terms of income or salary. 
The second thing is if you are uh, lucky enough to do what uh, Brian just told you and find a, a job that you don't necessarily have to be in a physical location, uh, like a like a warehouse or I work in a steel mill, right? You have to be at the steam, steel mill. You have to be at the hospital. You have to be wherever you work. Uh, you can geo arbitrage. I talk about this all the time. So say, for example, you work for Twitter in uh, uh, Silicon Valley or San Francisco, or wherever, wherever they're based out of, but you don't have to be geo located there. You know, instead of uh, living maybe in Detroit or Cleveland or whatever, why not go to, uh, you know, the Balkans? Why not go to Serbia, Montenegro, Croatia, go to uh, Asia, go to Vietnam, go to Laos, go to Cambodia. You can geo arbitrage your huge Silicon Valley salary while living like a king for 500 to a thousand bucks a month in a foreign country, right? If you're not able to do that, say you're in Brian in my position where you have a spouse or kids or things like that, you can still make a, you know, higher cost of living area salary while living in the States, you know, in like a literally like a Cleveland or Detroit, for example. I like the foot in both worlds concept of like understanding the fiat game, understanding the Bitcoin game. I want to talk about this, and I've been trying to bring up this term SaaS flow more often on like Twitter and also in this podcast. Uh, we are very good at saving Bitcoin. Like Bitcoin has one savings technology. We understand the macro forces at play. We understand the macro steamrollers coming. I am guilty of this. I'm guilty of sitting back, digesting macro information, sitting on my Bitcoin and believing that my Bitcoin will save me. And then I don't, I I use my energy to absorb more macro information rather than pouring it into the increasing income uh, bucket or uh, diversifying my income bucket. Okay. And there's mm -hmm. kind of this thing, there's, there's like two parts of YouTube. There's like the real estate will fix all your problems, personal finance world. And then there's like Bitcoin will fix all your problems, personal finance world. And I love both of these. Like I go watch real estate YouTube to relax from thinking about Bitcoin all the time. And mm -hmm. within real estate, there's the people that are cash flow maximalists and there's the people that are appreciation maximalists. So I say all of that to set the table. How like Bitcoin is great, like and is a complete base of savings that has materially changed my life and given me more motivation. It is a very motivating factor for me. I'm now craving a level up in this other like bucket. What do you think about the whole like Bitcoin isn't a cash flowing asset concept? Yeah, understood. So for me, for me personally, Bitcoin is my digital gold. Okay. So uh, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, they make fun of physical gold bullion. They say it's a shiny yellow rock, right? Doesn't throw off cash flow, doesn't produce EBITDA, doesn't produce net operating income like a rental property. Um, I get what they're saying. Doesn't produce dividends. It doesn't throw off cash. However, for me, Bitcoin is my plan A in terms of savings. Okay. I know that I own X amount of Bitcoin. No, actually, I lost them in a boating accident, but before I lost them in a boating accident, um, I owned, you know, X amount of Bitcoin. You know, if I did still have them today, you know, I'd probably pass it down to my kids, maybe my grandkids, right? But I don't have any. I own zero. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> my point is, is that that's my plan A. However, I come from traditional finance. So I'm playing both sides of the spectrum. I know that the Fed is literally causing inflation. I know that the M2 money supply looks like a hockey stick. I know that the velocity of money is crazy right now. My point is, is that you can understand the old world fiat game and still play it and do what these billionaires do is they sell their shares, you know, literally not insider trading, but inside trading, sell their uh, paper fiat, acquire hard assets. That's what I do. I, uh, I make gains on both, you know, uh, paper gains on Bitcoin because I'm not selling. Uh, for me, it's savings technology and it's always mm -hmm. a certain percentage of my net worth. But when it comes to stocks and all this fiat stuff, turn that into real estate, turn that into cash flowing assets, which I mentioned in that first tweet that you uh, referenced, and then also uh, save it in Bitcoin, a harder money. It's no different than, um, uh, uh, why am I drawing a blank? It's called um, the speculative attack by Pierre Rochard, Yeah. right? It's, yep. taking, it's taking a harder money uh, yep. or basically understanding when your money is being hyperinflated, like Zimbabwe, yep. Venezuela, whenever. It's a speculative attack on that money. You take the crappy fiat money, use it to buy hard assets, and you save. Money goes where it's treated best is what I'm trying to say. Yep. No, and the whole, like, so investment properties and Bitcoin are also both hinged on the same foundation that, yes, USD is a shit coin. And so that's the reason why I enjoy like advancing with both of them at the same time. And 
as I've said on this podcast before, it's very hard for me to separate in my brain the kind of like personal finance benefits of Bitcoin and the kind of like activism benefits of Bitcoin, like fix the money, fix the world, like end the Fed, like all those kind of things. It's very fused together in my brain. And so Mm -hmm. I just enjoy articulating it more of like, when I talk about Bitcoin taking ground and when I talk about get on zero and I, when I talk about Bitcoin as base money, like mm-hmm. that's mo- like that's just using Bitcoin like as base, like as the base liquidity. Like I think the apps and the personal finance apps and bank, like I think we're moving towards choose your unit banking. Like I think you're going to have all the same services that you're gonna have and you can use Bitcoin like as the base money. However, mm-hmm. as it is currently today, like there's there's good friends and people on Bitcoin Twitter that are building that world. Like that world is happening. So, yeah, I just think that's that's a re- that's what I'm personally focused on is because I know that world's coming. Because I know that world's coming. When I'm looking at this coming recession, and I want to pivot towards like recession and just things we can do and just how bad you think it's going to be. Mm-hmm. But I tweeted like something I'm focused on over the next twelve months is investing in more cash flow than sats in cold storage because i already have that base i have Mm -hmm. that base that i use and i believe that we're moving towards choose your unit banking so like i believe we're winning in the freedom aspect i believe we're winning in the tech aspect i believe like yeah bitcoin already like just the macro already makes sense so all that's there so that's how i'm trying to bridge both these worlds of like why i think there doesn't have to be a tension between like investing bitcoin investing cash flow is Mm -hmm. the net of that before you get to your question real quick, Brian, yeah. just a quick little tip that I talk about in all my videos, um, because I think that this applies and this is a good segue. If you look at your net worth as a pie, okay, think of it just like an empty pizza pie, okay, no slices. You need to establish what assets you want to be exposed to with the certain amount of percentage of your net worth. So for easy numbers, let's pretend uh, my net worth and your net worth is $100,000. Well, you need to figure out what assets do you want exposure to and how big of the slices of the pizza you want to be towards each asset. Okay. So uh, for me personally, let's just pretend Bitcoin. If I were to say Bitcoin is 20% of my slice or my pie, that means I have $20,000 of my net worth in Bitcoin for this example, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You need to create those slices and those weights and whatever those slices, if they go to zero, you're still able to sleep well at night. So if Bitcoin went to zero tomorrow, I'd say, son of a bitch, right? This sucks because I believe in it. I I really believe it's the hardest money ever created, but it went to zero and there goes that portion of my net worth to zero. Am I going to go jump off a building? Am I going to go drink myself to death? Am I going to go, you know, whatever, God forbid, any of that stuff? No, because I knew the risk going into it. Why do you think there's so much infighting going on right now in the Bitcoin community on Twitter? It's because people are either leveraged or they bit off more than they could chew. And you can start seeing it in their bickering and in their tweets. That's my personal opinion. I agree with that. And I said this morning, like, I think people, um, wait, taking a mental break, like for the summer, I think is very, both from macro fiat land, macro fiat land and Bitcoin land, like is very like, take a break for the summer. 100%. And how Marco is saying sleep good at night, like sleep good for the summer. Like you have to be able to sleep good for the summer. Um, and yeah, so that's why I think like, there's also other people that have tweeted out good advice, like on recession, like the number one to be recession proof is to like have really hard skills. Like, and that's where I'm just trying to verbalize this today for people. And a lot of this is just like lethargic for myself too, of saying, um, we have hard money. We crushed it. We get that. My brain gets that. But like, I think a lot of the bickering and infighting can also come from not being confident. We're less confident in our own skills than we are in our money. Like I've tweeted that out. Like we don't need more sats. We need more skills. Like we need to know the world is lacking from people that are able to do things. Like, and I want to be a person who can do things. That's, that's how I'm thinking about like the recession. And so- you crushed yeah. it, man, with that analogy. I love that analogy. I, for some reason, I didn't see those tweets come through. Um, I feel like with Twitter, I don't get like 90% of tweets from people that I follow, but I love that analogy. You know why? Um, so for the people that aren't, you know, handy men on this, on this podcast or handy women, um, you're going to pay someone who knows how to do it, right? So say you pay $1,000 for an electrician to screw in a light bulb. Well, you're paying them, you know, one cent for screwing in the light bulb. You're paying them $999.99 for knowing how to do it. Right. And if you don't have that skill set, you know, you're going to be left behind. So I think that's a hundred percent great analogy. I think knowing how to do things that other people don't will always um, put you in high regard in the value of the marketplace. Talk to us about this. You, t- you said that 
people under the age of 34 haven't felt a real bear market. And I think that's just because you're saying that we were still too young and just not in the marketplace when the great financial crisis 2008 happened. What? Yeah. Expound on that a little bit. 100%. Yeah. So I, I preface that. I said, this is a douchey, but true tweet. Okay. I know I'm very self-reflective. I know when I'm being a douche and when I come across as one, I don't care. That's just how I am. But all my truths, all my tweets are cold truths. They're not the uh, pleasant lies. Like you're great. You can do whatever you want. Here's a goal. No, my shit is like, listen, dude, like if you want to prosper, um, whatever, it doesn't matter Yeah. to, to explain that tweet. So if I'm 34 years old, I'm getting my finance degree. I'm in the middle of the greatest unemployment since the Great Depression. I graduated in December of 2010 when unemployment was like almost 11%. Okay, I have a finance degree, did all the internships, did everything you can ask for, got good grades, couldn't find a job to save my life. I sold cars, dude, after I graduated the finance degree. Okay, that's your cars. best referring video, right? It, it is. That's, how, that's, yeah. how, that's why I believe in fate. And that's why I believe in either this is a simulation or there's a higher power because my best performing video is uh, a car dealership video, right? So I think this all comes around full circle. Mm -hmm. And that's why you just have to live life and just kind of go through Moving with, with the skills, moving. You were on yes. the ground, moving with the skills. Yes. Right. I was able to make that video because I was a car yeah. salesman, right? Yeah. And I didn't like it. I didn't like any second of it, you know, but yeah. whatever. That's a story for a different podcast. But anyway, uh, my point is, is that you need to, um, if you haven't experienced a true bear market, if you're under like 34 years old, right? If you're 12 years old playing with Pokemon cards and, you know, your dad just lost a job, you may wonder why did dad lose his job, right? You don't, you weren't invested in the market. You didn't see your portfolio drop 40%, right? My portfolio was small. I've, I've been investing since 2006, but it still went down 30, 40%, just like everyone else's. So that was a prolonged recession, okay? We had a zero interest rate policy from basically 2008 to about 2013, 2014, um, they started increasing it slowly in 2016, and then the market crashed in December, January of 18, right around there. Um, and then we went back to ZERP, right? Zero interest rate policy. Uh, we had a flash crash in March of 2020. That was nothing. We printed trillions of dollars, lasted one month, two months, everything went back to where it was. My theory, um, heaven forbid this happens. I don't, I don't want to wish this or think that this will be a reality, but demographics are destiny. So if we have an aging population, you know, Elon Musk has been tweeting how we're not at the replacement birth rate, right? We have negative birth rate since roughly, I think the 60s or 70s. Anyway, um, I, I don't see us being Japan, but I could see, you know, a prolonged stagnant period in the market. Um, so for those that aren't familiar, the Nikkei, the Japanese Nikkei, if you put in a dollar in 1991, you're getting back a dollar in 2021, literally stagnant for 30 years, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think that's going to be the case because we're still the world reserve currency. We still have the petrodollar. We still have all these things, right? Uh, strong military. But my point is, is that you can only take your destiny into your own hands. So if you've never been through a prolonged recession, all of a sudden NFTs become unsexy, shit coins become unsexy, uh, penny stocks become unsexy. So why am I saying this? It's to help your audience understand you need to think of the pie and you need to invest in blue chip uh, things, Bitcoin, a uh, little bit of physical uh, precious metals, a little bit of blue chip stocks, dividend stocks, ETFs, real estate. Uh, you need to diversify your portfolio. Some people say diversification is diversification. I think that uh, di diversification for me personally allows me to live my life without checking um, you know, my block clock every two seconds, right? Seeing what the price is. I don't look at the price of Bitcoin. I've been dollar cost averaging for years. I don't give mm -hmm. a shit if it's 69,000. I don't care if it's 5,000. I don't care if it's 20,000. I buy yeah. X amount of Bitcoin every single week, like a freaking clock like every block, you know, every, uh, mm -hmm. you know, 1.1 uh, megabytes or whatever it is. And it's just, that's what I do. And I don't care because I have high conviction in the product or the asset. Do you have any thoughts for people that, and this is probably the bucket I'm in. I'm happy with like my pie. I'm super happy with my pie. I'm really want to work on the like shovel side. And mm -hmm. when I think about the recession, that's probably like what what is going to happen to millennials and millennial salaries do you, like how bad do you think this is going to be that's a great question so here's the biggest difference between 08 and uh, 2022 unemployment right now is almost at an all-time low okay i think the state of like uh, idaho has like a 1.1 percent unemployment rate like it's insane mm -hmm. right now 
So my point is, is that when I graduated in 2010, unemployment was almost 11%. Okay. That's why all these arms, these adjustable rate mortgages, that's why all these um, terrible underwriting mortgages, ninja loans, no income, no job. That's why the whole thing blew up is because they're just giving out loans left and right. They're more stringent today and unemployment is almost at an all-time high, right? Mm -hmm. So um, as long as- a Or all-time low. Yes. Sorry. I was thinking of it backwards. In my oh, you're good. Thank you. Yeah. So unemployment is essentially almost at an all time low right now. It's like three point something percent. Um, as long as the wages are intact, I feel like most human beings are responsible enough to pay their mortgage, you know, maybe yeah. pay the credit card. Some people are bad with that, but you're not getting kicked out of your house. Right. Especially yeah. if you have kids. Now, if you lose your job and your income goes poof and your adjustable rate mortgage just went up, you know, two, three percent, you know, over over the past month well, then you're up shit's creek without a paddle, right? So I think that as long as the jobs are stable and as long as the um, companies that are able to provide these jobs are stable, then it won't be as bad as 08. However, other people do think that we are in an everything bubble to where everything's overinflated and, you know, PE ratios are out of whack and, you know, uh, butt floss coin is going to the moon and all that stuff, which we did see. So yeah. I'm somewhere in the middle. This is my yep. thought process. Uh, I looked at a lot of studies hedge funds are increasing the amount of cash they have on their books. Um, and so are human beings or so people, yep. regular individuals, right? So I think I look at cash twofold. So your question kind of insinuated, how are you going to prep for this recession? Mm -hmm. How long is this going to be? How bad is it? How bad is it going to be? For mm -hmm. me personally, um, look at your cash as not only defense. So you're, you should always have an emergency fund. Uh, three to six months, if you have a family, 12 months, if you're an entrepreneur or a straight commission salesperson, that's the way I look at it. Okay. If you have that box checked, you'd think to yourself, well, hey, Marco, you know, why would I have more in cash? It's being inflated away, savers or losers, right? Mm -hmm. So my answer to that now is that your cash should also be looked at as offense now. So as a war chest. So if you're in Southern California, uh, let's say price is correct, 30, 40%, like they did in 08, right? Maybe mm -hmm. more. That could be a buying opportunity for you. Uh, mm -hmm. Say I'm in Cleveland. There was houses in class A rental markets going for like 40, 50 grand. You know, I would live there if I had to. It's not like a war zone. We're not in the hood. Mm -hmm. And now mm -hmm. those same houses are 160, 170, 180, mm -hmm. and they rent for 1300 bucks a month all day long. I know mm -hmm. people that are buying those things for 30, 40 grand cash, no questions mm -hmm. asked. So mm -hmm. my point to this ramble is that cash, while it is mostly has been trash over the past 13, 14 years because of low interest rates, because of zero interest rate policy, because of opportunities elsewhere, we're now starting to see that capitulation back to uh, harder assets, as I mentioned, you know, Bitcoin, real estate, uh, and then even cash, use it as your war chest. Most of it should be your emergency fund. Some of it should be for buying opportunities. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. What's your, and I hate that I'm at, even asking this because I hate, <laughs> uh, I hate like bed watching, but just for the sake of because we've made it all the way to this point, what's your over under on reversal? Uh, going uh, when the reversal, yes, T when tightening? going from tightening to easing. Yeah, so we've been in easing for a while uh, since March 2020. Woo! straight back to ZERP, right? Zero interest rate policy, uh, easy money, everyone's happy. Um, we're starting to see rate hikes like crazy. I have a tweet about this from, I think, December of 2021 or January of 2020. Uh, I just said the Fed is supposed to raise rates three times this year. I don't think they have enough ammunition to do so without crashing the market. Well, we saw them raise rates, you know, three plus times already this year. What happened to the market? It crashed. All you guys need to do is watch the inverse relationship between the S&P 500 and the federal funds rate. When rates go up, S&P 500 goes down. Same thing with all asset classes, real estate, all that stuff. So um, I guess I had Macro Alf on my podcast, Alfonso uh, yep. Picatiello. Um, he said that the bond market is already pricing in, I believe in 20, I can't remember. So I don't want to tell, I don't want to mm -hmm. sound like I'm talking about both sides of my mouth. It was either 2023 or 2024 to where the Fed funds rate is already expected to be starting to get cut and go down. Yep. But I, they're already talking about tightening now. They're already talking yeah. about it now, but I don't see that happening. I think they're going to, I think politicians have too much power to where they'd rather get reelected and crash the economy rather than, you know, slowing down on the rate hike. So um, that's just my opinion. But to answer your question, I'm seeing it within the next two years. Um, just in time for yeah. the having, my friends. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that the Fed will reverse course back to easing on the sooner rather than later side. Okay, so maybe it was maybe yeah. it was 2023. Do you think before yeah. that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this year. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. wow. Okay. Yeah. Cool. 
the and I also think Bitcoin is liquidity. So I'm I'm like very like I go all the way there of like I think Bitcoin is emergency fund, but zero dollar banking, I go off on that. But that's why I love this be. conversation. Yeah. It can be for sure, but I wouldn't want to be the guy. Uh, and don't get me wrong, I dollar cost average. I don't get a shit. Right. I don't give a shit what it is. But I would hate to be the guy that smash bought at sixty nine thousand, and then it's like shit. I got to fund my emergency fund when it's at twenty one thousand. You see for what sure. I'm saying? So Bitcoin yeah. should be. I don't use it as an emergency fund because for me, I always want it as a percentage of my net worth. I'd rather yep. give up my dirty fiat first in my emergency fund that I talked about, as opposed to selling one of the hardest assets ever created, in my opinion. No, yeah. What do you think? All right, two last questions. I want to dream big and then I want, yeah, I want to dream big. Do you, on the topic of just like Bitcoin replacing fiat, do you see that happening in our lifetime? Like, do you see Bitcoin based money circulating as currency inside our lifetime? So, like Nick Badia, layered money, you know, base money, that kind of a thing. Um, so let's see. In our lifetimes, I give myself knock on wood, uh, you know, maybe 50 more years. Uh, we'll see. Um, that's hard, man. There's gonna be a lot of pushback against it. And I feel like technology changes so fast that it could be a CBDC, it could be anything that just gets shoved down people's throats. So I'm gonna say in our lifetime, probably not. However, people with two brain cells are starting to realize, hey, this money's made up. This is bullshit. Mm -hmm. It's fiat, right? They're starting to understand mm -hmm. what you and I have already known for you know, 15, 20 years. So my point is, is that it doesn't matter to me because if Brian Harrington is uh, a Bitcoiner, Marco's a Bitcoiner, Brian has a very rare, scarce Porsche 911 that Marco wants to buy and he's open to trading in Bitcoin, it doesn't fucking matter. Yeah. Okay, that's the way that yeah. I look at it. It's just another coin to barter with. You know, that's Perfect. just the way that I look at it. Perfect. So then the last question I like to ask every guest, and I'm interested in your answer, is what is a Bitcoin product or service that doesn't exist yet that you think needs to exist? So this is, um, so I know it exists or it will exist shortly. Uh, I think Bitcoin has a, I don't want to say marketing problem. It has a user interface, like use case problem. So I want to be the 60 year old, 70 year old boomer who just got an iPhone and I know exactly what every single button does. I want it to be like idiot proof, right? Mm -hmm. I don't care about, I'm not sitting, uh, I'm not sitting here reading Inventing Bitcoin by Jan Pritzker or the Bitcoin standard by Safe Dina Moose or the bullish case for Bitcoin by Vijay Boyapati. I want to be the idiot that doesn't know anything about Rothbard, Murray, uh, you know, Mises, Austrian economics. I want to know sats go here. Brian gets sats, you know, like literally yep. I want it to be as dumb as possible. Um, so I guess this is a long winded way of saying um, Bitcoin needs to improve marketing and it needs to improve, uh, improve like everyday user use case usability, if that makes sense. Yep. No, perfect. Dude, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate this. Uh, audience, hope you loved just this quick episode. I like, I'm fired up. I'm fired up. Okay. So Marco, where can people like find you? Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for having me on, man. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. Um, Twitter, white boy, white, white boy, white board, Finn, F I N, uh, YouTube primarily, I uh, provide a lot of value there. Some of it's Bitcoin content, some of it's uh, traditional fiat content. Some of it is macro content. Um, I'm, I'm the combination. I feel like I'm the perfect guest for this podcast because I come from the traditional financial background, but also appreciate hard money and Bitcoin. Um, so I get it. I get both sides yep. of the coin. Um, so uh, YouTube, Whiteboard Finance, Instagram, Whiteboard Finance, Twitter, Whiteboard Fin, F-I-N. Yeah. And I'll just end on that. Look, if you're coming from Marco's channel and you're more of the traditional side, I just want you to know like you are like welcome here and you are welcome in Bitcoin. You don't need me to say that. The internet is a free and open place. Bitcoin is a free and open place. No one needs me to say that, but I want you to know my DMs are open, like and my podcast is open. And like, I like talking about this intersection. I grew up on Dave Ramsey. I get where they're coming from. I've watched like Marco's interviews with Alf. I've watched his interviews on how to buy a car. So it's all good people. And I, I just hope you have like a great summer and keep your, keep your pizza pie intact. That's what I I'm, that's it. what I'm hoping for. Always keep cool. your slices balanced. And, uh, you know, I, I, I love what you're doing, man. I really do because I feel like there needs to be a culmination of both these worlds. And I feel like the younger generations are starting to get it. 
However, I feel like they're getting too swayed by the allure of shit coins as opposed to understanding hard money and why their time and effort is being stolen away from them by inflation. Yeah. So um, I think once they start to get their first paycheck and see how much co goes out to Social Security, Medicare, this, this, and this, yeah. they're going to start to realize, oh, shit, okay, now is time. But yeah, thank you so much for having me on, Brian. I really appreciate it, buddy. Perfect. All right, everyone. See you on the next one. Hey all, this is Brian. You can reach me on Twitter at Brain Harrington. Shoot me a DM with any feedback from today's episode. This has been a Choice App production. Bitcoin has become eccentric to personal finance and we want to help you learn how to better engage with Bitcoin financial services. None of this is financial advice and is for education and entertainment only.